One of the most anticipated MCU projects has been Deadpool and Wolverine. Both of these characters finally coming in and cementing their stake inside the multiverse saga, but specifically the MCU canon. In today's video, we're gonna be diving in and ranking every single MCU movie and show, including Deadpool and Wolverine. We have about 47 things to talk about, so we're gonna jump right into this. As a preface though, this does not include any of the Netflix shows such as Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist. Those were not created under Kevin Feige. They were created during the MCU. They're now in canon. I'm not including those. I'm only including whatever Kevin Feige has had his name on. Feel free to include it in your ranking, but without further ado, let's get into this. Also, what's going to be really interesting about this ranking is that I have changed this a lot. My opinion has really shifted um, specifically from the comic book sphere and on rewatches of a lot of these things. So I think a lot of you guys might be surprised because sometimes I get some shit from my ranking. But coming down at my number 47 is Secret Invasion. I think this is the worst project the MCU has done yet. And I say that as someone who after the first two episodes, I was so on board with the show. I really liked it. But it just really fast and <laughs> when i say really fast it's like a train wreck um from episode three four five and i think there was a six episode it just died more and more and more to the point where they're like there was entertaining moments to it but overall it was a very disappointing series and I've never been truly excited about Secret Invasion. Um, I wasn't really excited when they announced it was going to be a show. I thought it should have been an Avengers level thing. But I was like, okay, the trailer looks awesome. It's kind of like going back to those Civil War days. And the show just, again, it, it's not great. Uh, it, it's it's baffling. I think a lot of those baffling moments really come from certain choices that now affect the overall MCU continuity that I can completely see them either completely ignoring or just overall trying to retcon in future films and shows such as the roadie reveal get into my number 46 and this is a series again and i think you'll see this trend with a lot of mcu shows where they start super strong and they quickly die out and at my number 46 it is echo this again i was so on board with those first three episodes i'm actually liking the character more than i liked her in hawkeye and i still do like the character but then the last few episodes just feel so deathly rushed. You don't get enough of Kingpin. You don't get enough of Echo's family. You don't get enough of her powers. You don't get enough exploration of her as a character. And again, it just feels rushed. And in the end of the day, forgettable. Again, I was so on board for this series. And then it just died. That brings me up to my number 45, and that is Captain Marvel. Now, I know there's some people out there who have actually kind of come around on this movie, starting to enjoy it a little bit more. And for me, I, the way I do rankings is what would I rather rewatch? Captain Marvel's just always been one of those movies that I just don't care to rewatch. I have nothing against Brie Larson. I actually really like her as the character. I wish they gave her better material to work with because she, again, is an incredible actress. But overall, the entire film is very forgettable, lacking that typical Marvel energy and specifically that typical Marvel energy that we expected from Phase 3 MCU films. And as a character that's telling an origin story, one of the biggest discomforts that it gives to the character is that she doesn't know who she is. So we're trying to discover it at the same time as her and she comes off so one-noted and so un... not friendly, but just not really like you want to follow her along for an adventure. I understand what they were trying to go for, but I think they should have found a better story to stick around here. It's enjoyable in some departments, but overall it's very forgettable. Brings me to my number 44 and this is the I am Groot shorts. I found them to be fun, but that's about it. Yeah, they're canon, but they're shorts and literally that is it. We're at my number 43, and that is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, one of my most anticipated projects in the entire MCU. A lot of that came from because I love Kang the Conqueror. I think he is such a cool villain. Love the first Ant-Man film, and I love Paul Rudd as the character, and I even enjoyed the second one for what it was. But this film is one of the few MCU films I do not own on Blu-ray. And why is that? Because I do not give a shit to own it. I do not care to own it. I don't care if my OCD is bugging me that I don't have the film. The film was not good. 
It wasn't good for a lot of different reasons, and it really killed, specifically on rewatches, the more and more you check it out. I think on a surface level thing, there is so much fun to be had here. And maybe down in the future now, knowing that Kang is not going to be the upfront style, at least of what it seems in the MCU, maybe you can enjoy this for what it is. But for all the hype that they surrounded this villain, for him to literally be defeated by ants and Ant-Man, it just takes it away every time I tried to watch this film and enjoy it. There is a lot of kooky, fun, sci-fi stuff that I have fun with in this movie, but it's overly CGI'd that just takes away, and it takes away from the greatest parts of Ant-Man, which is his shrinking abilities, his growing abilities, which the first two films had such a fun thing with, and I think, again, I understand what they're trying to do in this new universe and what they were trying to say with the way that they shrank all the way down. I like some of the answers they gave to us of where Janet's been. But at the same time, I really needed a lot more from this movie in, in clear direction of establishing where the MCU is going to go. And even the ending pisses me off. Like, okay, cool. So, like, Kang's gone, and we know, like, there's this whole Kang council. But the ending just ad ends so happily. Like, it's all wrapped up with a bow tie. Really? Like, that's it? Like, if I if I was Ant-Man coming back, and I knew that dangerous man, that there was multiple versions of him out there, oh, I'd be going to Captain America. Let him know, like, we got to do something about this. But no, nothing. So overall, it's a very forgettable movie. It's overly CGI'd, which I understand it had to be, but some of the CGI just feels a little bit messy. Some good jokes here and there, but not enough to suffice to make me want to rewatch this ever again. Now we get into my number 42, and that is The Marvels, a movie that I find good, but messy as shit. And I think you really see that mess once you come to rewatching it a couple times over. And it's, again, a film that I liked. I enjoyed I think the chemistry between the three Marvels are so much fun. They're honestly kind of the saving grace of this movie, and that's the reason that I did find this movie good. Everything else about the movie, including the story, is really messy. When you go back and rewatch it, and maybe even some of you guys noticed on our first rewatch how messy the film can be. I think the whole cat stuff is kind of dumb and really much a weird side plot. And then also it feels like I'm missing context of what happened with Captain Marvel after the first film. And they're having to put this into the side plots in here. Which makes it kind of feel like you're playing a game of catch up. And it feels like there should have been one other Captain Marvel movie in here before we got this movie. But we have the team up. If you like these characters, I think there's enjoyment to be had in the movie. But it's also another one of those MCU films that I just haven't had the gravitas to go back and rewatch and enjoy. But shout out to that end credit scene. I did like that and I'm curious to see where it goes, if it ever goes anywhere, because it feels like none of these have ever been going anywhere. Now we're at my number 41, which is She-Hulk Attorney at Law, a show that should have been a simple trajectory of cases of the week, who is She-Hulk defending, and in the end of the day, it wasn't really that. It, it tried to be, but also it tried to be a little bit more than that. And I think it really just didn't ever find its footing in terms of what story it wanted to tell, what villains it wanted to see. But I do think that towards the last three episodes, it did start to find something, which puts it above the rest. I enjoy Tatiana Maslany as the character of She-Hulk. I think she is phenomenal as this. I think her chemistry, her personality is the reason that I would rather rewatch this show than anything else that I've already talked about. Maybe it's a little bit of the twerking as well. Maybe that's just awesome in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eat it up. Hopefully anyway, I know some people hated that, but it, it didn't bother me. It was fun. And same thing with the whole Daredevil thing. I was actually genuinely surprised at how they handled Daredevil. But it's a slow show, and it's a show that honestly should have been a binge than a week-to-week -week release. I think if you binge it, it is a tad bit better. Some of the humor is not going to work for everybody. I can understand it being cringe. I liked it. It was fine. Again, not something I would put on the top of my list to rewatch, but also something I would rather rewatch than everything else I've already mentioned. Also, specifically, because it didn't really ruin anything in the MCU, so take that as what you will. Except Abomination. They should have done more with him. I, I personally think. And also, the, the final episode, the super fourth wall breaking, that was wild. Now we get into my number 40, and that is Thor The Dark World. And take it as for what you will, I think a lot of this movie can be pretty boring and a little bit forgettable, but I've actually grown a little bit more attached to this movie because the original phases, I feel, as the more that I kind of go back and rewatch them and then see what we're currently getting, there is this nostalgic flair to it. Now, I'm not here to try and defend Thor The Dark World. Not at all. I think it is a very 
boring film at times, but there is a lot of good stuff in here, specifically Thor and Loki's dynamic, which is very much grown. I love seeing their brotherly relationship in here, and I think it is actually the core and heart of what the entire Thor franchise has very much been about. But truly enough, here, the heart of the story and the reason that this film is in any way, shape, and form higher than anything else on this list. And going back and watching it, the visual effects are great. I think Alan Taylor does a good job with the action department. The boring part is really much just the story and specifically the villain that they centered on. And when you go back and read Thor comics with the Dark Elves, it is even more severely disappointing because the Dark Elves are some of the coolest stuff in Thor's lore. So overall, Dark World, not too bad. Kind of a little bit better than you would remember, but also not the greatest. Brings me down to my number 39, which is Iron Man 2. A very messy story that's trying to set up all the Avengers stuff and move us forward while also giving us an Iron Man sequel. And at the same point in time, it's still enjoyable. A lot of that being because of Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is the man. When you watch him playing Iron Man, it's hard to not be delighted and enjoyed from what he is giving us in the MCU. And he automatically bumps this film up on the list. No matter how messy the film can be in terms of its storytelling and what it's trying to accomplish, everything feels so surface level in terms of its attempts to elevate or give development to anything else. But the one thing that it is centered on is is who Tony Stark and Iron Man is. And in the end of the day, this kind of feels like a nice little side story to get us prepared for the Avengers, but as well as more time with Tony Stark. I think the action is really great, specifically in the third act when you see War Machine and him teaming up. I always get giddy during that sequence. And the entire like suit up sequence during the race car scene awesome. I think Whiplash deserved a little bit more. Sam Rockwell's character, we need him to come back because he was so great in here. Overall, an enjoyable time, but also one that is messy and a tad bit forgettable. That brings me to my number 38, which is Falcon and the Winter Soldier, a series that I should have loved, and I ended up just going, that was fine. That was enjoyable. It's nice. You don't need to see this before the next Captain America. Maybe some details with like Isaiah Bradley might help. But overall, if you saw Endgame, saw he was getting the shield, you understand where he's going into this. And I think that's one of the things is that this series wraps that nice bow up. You didn't need to really watch it because there wasn't anything life altering. I did like what they did with Bucky, though, in here. I think Sebastian Stan, I think it's a lot of nice personality. And again, development to his character, Bucky, with the PTSD that he's being involved in. Again, Anthony Mackie, I think, does do a good job showcasing why he should be the leader up front as Captain America. But I think the mess of this really just comes down to the story, the villains, and everything else to that. Also, shout out to U.S. Agent. I was actually kind of surprised by how interesting that character actually was. Now we get into my number 37, and that is Ant-Man and the Wasp, a fun, enjoyable little adventure where it really much is that kind of side thing of setting up and kind of that little palate cleanser after Infinity War, and I enjoyed it. I liked heist stuff. I like seeing the Wasp in here a little bit more and how she's integrated, but overall, it is another heist story, and it's small in scale, and they have fun with the, all the different now being able to grow and being able to shrink. And it's just more of what you enjoyed from the first Ant-Man film. Is it as good as the first Ant-Man film? No, not, not at all. But Ant-Man and the Wasp is a completely fine and fun film that does nothing to harm the MCU, nor does it do anything to harm you. That brings me to my number 36. And this movie is not one that I ever really care to rewatch, but it is one that I more appreciate. And I appreciate more of this director's just work in general. And that is Kenneth Branagh's Thor. I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of defending natures on this and think it's like one of the best MCU films and I full power to you. I think Kenneth Branagh does a really good job bringing to life Asgard, bringing to life the mythology. I just can't get on board with like everything on Earth. I know how Shakespearean it can be and I know that it's a whole part of Thor's development cycle, but I just find it boring. I find it completely boring when they go to Earth, but everything on Asgard, awesome, peak, uh, incredible. I wish they spent more time on that personally. I would actually be pretty open to Kenneth Branagh coming back to direct another Thor film, maybe even the final Thor film to Chris Hemsworth, but we'll see if that ever happens. That brings me to my number 35, and that is Miss Marvel. I really like this show. I thought it was adorable. I thought it was cute. And I like the character that Iman brought to life. And I've always liked Miss Marvel specifically in the comics. I think she's always a nice little palate cleanser. This shouldn't have been a movie. I like that it's a show. Again, maybe one or two more episodes could have fleshed out certain things since we spent so much time on that time travel aspect. But the Miss Marvel aspect to me is giving me a character that I can root for, that I can cheer for, and that I can just be excited when they pop on screen. And Iman 
filled this show with such bubbly personality that it's hard to deny how fun this show can be. Again, doesn't change too much in the MCU, but it is adorable, and I liked it. We get into my number 34, and now this is kind of like an ongoing one. It's What If Season 1 and 2. We obviously know we're getting a Season 3, and... Overall, I've really enjoyed my time with What If. I think season two was an improvement over season one overall. And I think a lot of that specifically is, is them actually tackling and having a little bit more fun with the multiverse. And I'm hoping that season three can kind of even play on that even a little bit more. Now, again, is it life altering in the MCU? Not at all. Is my urge to go back and rewatch every episode there? Not really, but there are certain episodes that really stick out to me, and it is a really cool concept to see some of our favorite heroes go down different paths, or maybe some even new heroes that we have not been introduced yet into the MCU. But I think with this entire multiverse saga, it is a cool concept to keep playing around in and asking that question, well, what if this character did this instead? and having those avenues and seeing how that one choice changes so much. Some episodes can be cringy and a waste of time, but others can really make the entire show stick out, and that's why I like it. We get into my number 33, and it's Hawkeye. Hawkeye, again, starts strong, overall ends a little bit weaker, but stronger than most of the MCU shows. And I think a lot of that comes off the backs of Haley Steinfeld giving an incredible performance as Kate Bishop, but also at the same time, Jeremy Renner giving an amazing performance as Hawkeye too. And specifically coming out of Endgame, how he was feeling with his family now being back and being dragged into the entire action due to his past as the Ronin. And I like it. It's a fun little Christmas venture. I think it's good at times. I think some of the Kingpin stuff should have been introduced a tad bit earlier, but I liked it. I enjoyed it. It's not as good as the comic it's based off of, but I think if you like Hawkeye, you should enjoy this as well. We get into my number 32, and this is another one that is mostly up here because of how visceral this one is for me, and that is the Incredible Hulk. Edward Norton's great in this role. But the Hulk itself, like, this is the Hulk that I have been missing. I really liked his usage in, like, the first two Avengers films as well. But his usage in this movie is incredibly badass. And his fight against Abomination sticks out immensely. I also really like Edward Norton's performance as Bruce Banner. Now, obviously, I'm more accustomed to Mark Ruffalo in the MCU. But I think Norton did a good job, too, here. I think as time has gone on, this is a film that has actually grown a little bit more. I mean, it's always an interesting one. That when you do your rewatches and you go back to it, you kind of sit there and you're like, if this film had done better, can you imagine the entire tone of the MCU? It might be a little bit more like this one. It's fun. It's badass. It's enjoyable. I miss Incredible Hulk stuff. I hope we get more Hulk content in the future, specifically after Brave New World. We get into my number 31, and that is Captain America, the first Avenger. I think this is such a fun origin story that would be immensely higher on this list if it did not montage through so much of his origin story. I think this movie should have easily been at least 20 minutes longer to develop a little bit more Peggy Carter, to develop a little bit more Bucky. They do a good job of that, though but it could have been even stronger. But with that said, for what they were going through for with the World War II theme and Captain America and Chris Evans, it all gets nailed. The production design is so great. I love Chris Hemsworth's introduction as Steve Rogers and understanding his values. And again, that plays into all the different thematics that we see Steve Rogers go through later on within the Avengers, within Winter Soldier, within Civil War, throughout the entire franchise. And it makes you miss Chris Evans as Captain America. I'm excited for Anthony Mackie, but I do miss him as Captain America. And I just find this film to be a ball. That brings me to my number 30. And that is the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, which again, if Hawkeye was a fun Christmas thing to watch every Christmas, the holiday special is pure joy. And I think James Gunn wrote such a fun and phenomenal little holiday special that I have now, ever since it's come out, watched it a couple times during Christmas season because it just feels and it gets you into those moods. And I like that this focused more on Mantis and Drax. And now watching this before going into Guardians 3, you get a little bit more emotion of understanding those two characters. And it even makes you appreciate certain things in Guardians 2 a tad bit more. I think this is a fun adventure and one that I always look forward to revisiting when I get to it. That brings me down to my number 29, and that is Thor Ragnarok. I, I know, every time I do this list, it moves up a little bit, and all of you guys still bitch and complain at me. I get it. It might be in your top 10. It's not in mine. It's not my favorite Thor movie. 
I think it's a fun time. But I think what Taika did with this movie was a lot more improv than I actually wanted. And I think some of the jokes, some of the jokes take away from the tension. I understand. I'm, I'm going to defend Thor and Love and Thunder. Understand that. It's my opinion personally. Like, just, I get it. But Thor Ragnarok, like, it's just never really hit for me, specifically on rewatches. I think some of the humor is fun. I think some of the comedy is there. But bringing Hela in here and how dark this film should be, I actually wish it was a little bit darker to it. I don't think Taika was the perfect director for this. And I say that as a fan of Taika Waititi. But the Hulk stuff, pretty damn fun. The Thor stuff, pretty cool. Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie, awesome. Loki, awesome. Hela's battle, cool. But overall, in terms of what they're trying to do, I think it does some good things for Thor's character. But again, it takes away from so many different moments. I wish they would have just done a Planet Hulk thing instead. I think mixing it was fun. I have fun with this movie. It's obviously up higher a little bit more on this list than a couple of the others, but it's never hit it out of the park for me personally. Now it brings me down to my t number 28, and every time I watch this movie, I want to love it, but I just like it. I still think it's a little bit of a mess, and that is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I think Sam Raimi's direction here is some of the strongest and throughout the entire MCU. I think Elizabeth Olsen does a phenomenal job as an evil Scarlet Witch, and I wish that development was even more throughout this. I wish we got more of that. Benedict Cumberbatch is greatest Doctor Strange, but my biggest issue that comes down to this is not how they handle the Illuminati. I've kind of come to terms with that. I like that choice. It's two things. It's one, you call it multiverse of madness, but there's really no madness. The multiverse is, is kind of just, you kind of skip through it and it just wraps it up with a nice bow. Like you get this eye and then he, he just goes with the eye and jumps into a portal with Clea and that's about fucking it, which I'm excited to see what they do with Clea. Uh, I'm excited to see what they do with Charlize Theron's Clea. But with that said, the biggest aspect and the biggest wrongfulness of this film is how rushed it feels. There's an entire part where I feel like we should have had a conversation between Strange and Nurse Palmer or in that multiverse dimension when they're going through and they're all abandoned and they get to that other Strange with the musical notes, which is an awesome fight scene. That's why I say Sam Raimi really went to ham in here and uh, Danny Elfman's score also great, but it just never really develops strange all too much. It's too barren on giving us just entertainment. And that's okay. I'm entertained by this. I like the horror tones to it. I would rewatch this movie. But I just can't get fully locked into the story of it all. Now brings me down to my number 27, and that is Iron Man 3. I think completely underrated. I think specifically now with what you've done with Shang-Chi, I think this film is only elevated now with the Mandarin and understanding that we can forgive the entire cop-out. I understand people were very disappointed at the time of that. For me, I've always enjoyed Iron Man 3. I've always found it to be fun. I like the twist. I like the twists and turns. I like that it's more of a Tony Stark story than it is an Iron Man one. And I think as an epilogue to Avengers, it is actually a really good epilogue in encouraging his PTSD that he had when he went through that portal. And I think the ending of this could have been a little bit stronger if future MCU films kind of bantered off that. But what Shane Black does here is fun. I like Tony Stark more as him. And I think we get so much of Robert Downey Jr. in here that it is an incredible fun surprise. Maybe some things here and there I don't like, but nothing that sticks out to me all too well. We get into my number 26, which is Spider-Man Homecoming, a just delightful, fun John Hughes homage with Peter Parker in the center of the story. Do I wish that maybe he swung around a little bit more and some of the humor is a little bit tad bit too high schoolish? Yeah. I get why it's like that. It does very much harken back to John Hughes movies, but I liked it and I liked it a lot. And immensely, the more I think about it, the more enjoyable it is. I think Tom Holland showcases how he is the perfect high school Peter Parker and Spider-Man. I also really liked Michael Keaton's Vulture, which I've been very diehard in saying I do not like the character of the Vulture in like almost any sort of media. And this was like the first time that I've gone, wow, I like Adrian Toomes. I like the twist involving him and his daughter and how that ties into Spider-Man's life. And overall, as a first trilogy, this is a nice first parter that only keeps establishing more of why we like Tom Holland as this character. We get into my number 25, and that is 
Ant-Man. Ant-Man is just a damn good time at the movies. I'm a fanatic when it comes to heist films, and I think overall this nails it. It has the heist element. It has the Honey, I Shrunk the Kid element, and it's all just overall enjoyable. Paul Rudd is great as Scott Lang. Michael Douglas as Hank Pym was a great addition. I love that dynamic. I was a little bit skeptical, I remember, when they announced that it was not going to be the Hank Pym at the first as the main character, but then the usage of it just really works out. And in the end of the day, when you come down to all the shrinking mechanics and how it looks, it looks great. It's a lot of fun. You can enjoy it for what it is. And again, it just introduced a fun new character. Get into my number 24, and that is the first Doctor Strange movie, which added the mysticism to the entire MCU and was such a really much insane film. Scott Derrickson, I think, does an incredible job directing this. Part of me wishes he would have done Multiverse of Madness, and then the other part of me was very happy that we had Sam Raimi come back to direct that. But the first Doctor Strange really just establishes a nice origin story for a character that I'm very happy that we now have in the MCU. Is the villain the best? Nah. Could, did they waste Mads Mikkelsen? Yeah, basically. But I really like the dynamic between Wong, the Ancient One, and again, seeing how Stephen Strange becomes the magician and the Sorcerer Supreme that we really needed him to be. And I think he's such a great character in those instances, and again, in this movie establishing him, it's great to see where he goes. Get into my number 23, and that is Avengers Age of Ultron, a movie that kind of similar to Iron Man 2, but stronger because of its characters. And in this film, it's setting up a lot. It needs to set up Civil War. It needs to set up certain dynamics between other characters. It's trying to set up Thor Ragnarok. It's trying to set up certain things with Hawkeye. It is doing so much all at once and not really giving enough development to Ultron himself, who is in the comics one of the coolest characters that I really hope they bring back one day. And James Spader does a fucking great job voicing him. And I want more of Age of Ultron. But this is a fun film. It's another Avengers. The Avengers are finally together. They team up here. And, and it's nice to not have that background of having to build them up. We already have them as the team here. And that's why it's so high on my list. Because I get to just see them in action. Not having to set up. Not having them break up. Not, none of that bullshit. We just get the meat and grit of it. And I think this is such a fun Avengers movie, all for those reasons. Then we get into my number 22, and that is Black Widow. Black Widow was a big surprise. Now, when you watch it in chronological order, I think this film just hits so much harder than where it actually came out and should not have been the kickoff to phase four. Personally, it should have came out during phase three, but now getting that chance to go back and rewatch it. I appreciate this film. I've liked it since the start, but again, I appreciate it more now with the centerpiece of what we get here. I love the dynamic of what we get to see within the black widow with Yelena, with the red guardian. I love David Harbour. I love the entire cast in here. I hope we get to see more of Rachel Weiss as well. I think these characters all work in harmony and I like the spy thriller. I like how she's off the grid and has to come out and I think Scarlett Johansson does a great job with that. Specifically for Black Widow, the tone and grit of this entire film really smacks hard for me and the only issue I truly have with it is some of the stuff they do with Taskmaster and just in general, the villain. I think the villain is tad weak and the third act goes a little bit too big for its bridges, where I wish it would have been a little bit more low to the ground. Overall, Black Widow, I think, is a very underrated MCU film, and I don't get the hate on this one. We get to my number 21, and this is where I'm going to have to start defending myself because I know everyone's going to fucking hate me for this, but Thor Love and Thunder. I love this movie, and why do I love it? I just do. It works for me. Everything that I complained about with Taika Waititi and the Thor Ragnarok that everyone complains about within this movie, it's like the opposite. I feel like that when dramatic moments need to happen, such as Lady Thor dying, or in general, the whole decision of Gore with his daughter, those were certain moments moments in this film that like could have been easily hindered by comedy and it wasn't or even the boat discussion between Thor and Lady Thor when they're talking about her cancer it's things like that that just work for me the humor where it's placed actually does hit now on rewatches the goats are annoying Korg sometimes gets in the way a tad bit too much and I I think it's a little too small for its scale and some of the film does look like shit and I think a lot of that is just more of like using the volume and I wish overall they used Gore a tad bit more because I think Gore's an awesome villain, but 
For the peak of what I wanted it to do with the cancer storyline of Lady Thor, I think it established that immensely, and it actually gave Natalie Portman and Chris Hemsworth some chemistry to work with, and I really enjoy this one. No, I know, a lot of you guys don't like it, but I do, and I hope you can at least respect that. My number 20 is Spider-Man Far From Home, which I still think has some of the best action sequences in any Spider-Man film thus far. And I knew th that John Watts had to cook when you're bringing in Mysterio, who for me is my personal favorite Spider-Man villain of all time. I've loved him in the comics. I love him in gaming. I loved him in this movie. And I think Jake Gyllenhaal does a great job. Like you're mixing and matching. Like this film is like a total biasness for me because you have Jake Gyllenhaal playing Mysterio, one of my favorite actors, my favorite Spider-Man villain. And you bring that to life in such a great way. I love the change in usage of him. Does everything in this film work? No. There's a lot of dumb choices, and as an epilogue to Endgame, there's certain things that I just don't believe in, specifically with the glasses and Tony Stark leaving for him those. I, I understand those hates. But this is one of those movies that really just works for me on every single level other than those small little things, which could be big for some. But as another Spider-Man adventure, I like the development of him and MJ's relationship. I like how they're starting to further that. I think it's just fun. And when I'm going to a movie, specifically in the MCU, I want to be entertained and I want to have, be fun. And Far From Home delivers immensely all that and more. Then we get into my number 19, and that is Eternals. Again, another one that I know many of you might have closer to the bottom, but in the further reaches of how we've gotten after post-Endgame, I'm happy that Eternals existed because Eternals is more feeling like a DC film where it's a little bit darker. It's a little bit more grittier. And I like the vastness of the characters and some of their choices that they have to make. And I also like the usage and how Chloe Zhao actually discusses that and how the film looks. The film looks beautiful. It looks immaculate. The storytelling and its thematics are really strong for me and hit me in a soft spot to where I really understand what these beings are trying to do. And I like how they are hailed as more of gods that have been behind the scenes manipulating certain things for years and eternally and internally decades. And specifically, I know that there's certain little issues that people have with in terms of what it means for the MCU. But it's kind of like one of those things that just kind of sits in the background, hasn't really been explored yet. I really like it. The cosmic realm of the Eternals, I think, is established in a unique way. Icarus, I think, is a really unique character that adds a lot of flavor to this all. And Makari is just, I, I'm in love with her. Her and Drew Egg, I, I think, are great. Uh, even Angelina Jolie was phenomenal in this. I It sucks that we're probably never going to get an Eternals 2, but I hope that their stories are continued in some way, shape, and form because I was fascinated with these characters. I fell in love with this group of family, and I loved where the story was going. It's, again, I know that is a very unpopular take but it is one that really works for me get into my number 18 which is another bias one you have oscar isaac one of my favorite actors playing moon knight and i like moon knight a lot in fact i love a lot of it i don't get me wrong i wish they never blacked out his fighting scenes when he goes all berserk and crazy i think that was dumb to keep that a mystery but for me, it nailed the thematics of what I like from the Moon Knight comics and specifically some more of the newer runs. And I'm excited to see where the future of Moon Knight goes. I think this was a nice origin story, a nice setup season for the future of it all. It goes a little bit too big. That's true. But I think overall what Oscar Isaac does in here is incredible. Some of those middle episodes within that whole mental facility was insane. Ethan Hawke is just incredible. Of course, bringing in the Scarab and how that all adds to May's character, I just thought was great. Moon Knight is a very unique experiment, but I think Benson and Moorhead does such a great job directing this. We get into my number 17, and this is Captain America Civil War. Another one that I know is probably pretty high for some of you. I just come away from this that I don't think there's a lot of high stakes in this movie. Take that away, though. This is an awesome time at the movies. Having the Avengers really much be broken up and have to choose a side of who they are behind between Cap and Iron Man. And in the end of the day, this still being a Captain America movie and one that you can fully support and get behind. And that's what I love is that there's an ideology between both of these characters that it is hard to choose. You understand why Cap's doing this and you also understand why Iron Man's doing this because of the struggles that have kind of gone on in their lives. And I, again, love the usage of everyone coming in here. Same thing with Black Panther. Chadwick Boseman steals almost the entire film and the show and his introduction as Black Panther is one of the best introductions in the entire MCU. 
alongside that, Spider-Man finally comes into the MCU and makes his appearance. I love the usage of him and him and Tony Stark's whole entire relationship. This is, again, one of those movies that when you watch it, it brings all the excitement. I just wish the airport fight scene was a tad bit stronger in terms of its stakes. I do think, and I still believe this, that someone should have died here, but they didn't. But it's still awesome. We get into my number 16, and that is WandaVision. WandaVision, honestly, I think is almost a 10 out of 10 besides the finale. Everything leading into this was such a weird and unique experience, and one that developed something that I didn't know what to expect. And while it was a slow burn to get to it, it really opens up a totally passionate thing that made me respect the MCU more in terms of its storytelling when it comes down to TV. And I know that they can pull off stuff like this because the entire episode worth Wanda's past and then the entire statement about grief, uh, it breaks my heart every single time I think about it. It breaks my heart every time I've gone back to rewatch this. And again, while WandaVision does not execute a great finale and it goes back more towards the basis and the basicness of a Marvel or just a generic comic book film, I still appreciate for what WandaVision was attempting, and I cannot wait to see what Matt Shackman does with the Fantastic Four. We get into my number 15, and that is Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which, again, speaking of grief, this was a great meditation on grief coming past Chadwick Boseman's death, and this is a hard film. It's a hard one that I can't imagine what they went through the stakes of making, and it is one that breaks my heart when I do watch it, specifically in that opening scene. But... I think for what it does for moving us forward past T'Challa, it does a great job. It does a great job of also bringing in Namor and establishing him. I think there's certain choices in terms of who should have been the Black Panther. I think it would have been nice to see Shuri become the Black Panther at the very end of the film. And I would have loved to have seen Angela Bassett actually take on that mantle of the Black Panther for a majority of the movie. I think that would have been nice to see as well. Or even Lupita Nyong'o and then pass it down. But in terms of a love letter to Chadwick Boseman and a love letter to T'Challa, I think Wakanda Forever nails those aspects. It's big in its action. It's fun in establishing it. And I think what Ryan Coogler was handed was one of the hardest jobs possible, but I think he made it work. We get into number 14. I think this is one of the most fun offshoots that Marvel's done yet, and I hope they do something again soon in the same vein, and that is Werewolf by Night. Something I kind of rolled my eyes at when the trailer came out. I liked the characters they were putting into here, but I was like, really? This is what we're doing? We're going to have Michael Giacchino direct this? Really? I don't know all too much. And then you watch it, and you're like, holy shit. I remember when I got the screener, I used all five plays. I had to keep rewatching this. I was so obsessed with it. And then when it came out, it's become a Halloween tradition to go back and rewatch this. It's so much fun. And it brings back those nostalgic feelings of watching old school horror films with my dad when I was like three or four years old that would play during October season. And Werewolf by Night filled all those ventures. It also introduces some pretty badass new characters. And I need some more Man Thing. Man Thing is so great. I love how brutal they let Michael. Giacchino go with this and again I'm sitting here waiting when are we getting the Midnight Suns get these guys into a team get to my number 13 and this is Shang-Chi other than Black Panther I think this is like one of the best origin stories in the MCU past phase three and I think a lot of that just goes to Simu Liu's entire performance and the way that he embodies and brings to life Shang-Chi it also goes down to Destin's direction and how he's able to direct the action as well as the father-son story that is very heartbreaking about a broken family tony leong is phenomenal in this as his father and again as the true mandarin and this is one of those films that i love going back into revisiting i cannot believe that we're still waiting on another shang chi film or just in general another shang chi like appearance because the way that this film ended it seemed like it was the perfect next step to jump into this all and i'm hoping while again while i'm at san diego comic-con it might have already happened as the time this video is going up that they have announced an official release date of shang chi 2 because i need it now get into my number 12 which is black panther black panther for me is about everything that i really needed it to be in nailing and bringing to life wakanda but at the same time establishing this character that i just fell in love with in civil war just a bit more and his entire family his entire culture and I think Black Panther for me the reason I'm obsessed with it is because I'm obsessed with the world of Wakanda I'm also obsessed with the usage of Killmonger and how him and Black Panther very much have the same ideologies kind of like a Magneto and Xavier but handling it in completely two different ways and in the end Killmonger does teach Black Panther T'Challa something here 
And while it maybe was too late for Killmonger, he's able to establish this and hopefully bring it into the world that we need him to have it in. Then we get into my number 11, and that is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, a film that has only grown on me since Guardians of the Galaxy 3, established and brought to life so much. And I think when you have a perfect trilogy like this, which I think right now is definitively the best comic book movie trilogy of all time until Spider-Verse 3 comes out, we'll see if that surpasses it, but... Guardians 2 is that middling chapter that is more of a character study than actually a big adventure. And in the way that it segues and separates all the characters into establishing very must have character development, and also growing the stakes of Peter's father and having him have to make a choice, all of these things really work wonders for me. I think what James Gunn did here and knowing what the ending of these characters was gonna be really established something special here when it comes down to Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Now we have hit the official top 10 of this and that is at my number 10, the first Avengers movie, which has kind of grown on me. My wife loves to put on this movie and every time I watch it with her, which is about five to six times a year, you just get sucked into it. I know, like, if you go back and look at other rankings, I had this lower, and a lot of it came down to, why would I rewatch this? You know, I have Infinity War, I have Endgame, I have all these characters, but there's a classic charm to it. And out of any film made in the MCU, there is that classic feeling to where I would say, yeah, if you ask me what classic comic book movies would be, I think Avengers can be called a classic Hollywood picture. And specifically what it established and bringing characters from other films all together and merging franchises into one and really much kicking off the next generation of the comic book movie boom. And I love what Avengers was able to do. I think the way that it establishes the characters, their development, just puts a smile on my face. I think there's so much charm to it. Does the film have slow pacing here and there? Yes, I do think it does have that specifically in the first act, but it does get better and better and better until it delivers one of the best third acts in any MCU film yet. And we get into my number nine, and my number nine is the original Iron Man that kicked this all off. This is, again, another one of those films that if you were to talk, talk about something being a classic, classic it would be this Robert Downey Jr. is so freaking good in the role he brings to life the MCU from his performance and specifically what he was able to establish as Tony Stark and also looking at this and what he's able to do this film it's hard to not always have this in your top 10 because of what it does for the MCU without this film we wouldn't have anything at all this film still looks incredibly well it holds up incredibly well in terms of its humor in terms of its action in terms of its visual effects and in terms of its storytelling we get into my number Number eight, and that is Captain America the Winter Soldier, one that actually really changed the game for multiple different things. Then we couldn't look at, you know, Kevin Feige picking a random directors from the community, the Russo brothers, to direct something because they came out here swinging with an incredible story that is hearkening back to the old school political thrillers. Even bringing in Robert Redford was an incredible idea, but also a personal story for Captain America and Bucky. And for me, the action top tier here it's one of the strongest things in the mcu but also the stakes feel larger than ever especially bringing in hydra and this is for me where the point of the mcu f like if you watch this you knew i have to watch every mcu film going forward and it makes me curious who else was a part of Hydra this entire time? And we get into my number seven, which is Spider-Man No Way Home. One of the best Spider-Man films of all time and one of the best comic book movies of all time. Is it messy at the start? Yeah. When you watch it at home, do you see that messy aspect a lot more? Yeah. Yeah. But it, for me, is a love letter to live-action Spider-Man films in so many ways, particularly the villains, particularly the heroes, and bringing in Toby and Andrew and the usage of them, I think, is some of the strongest aspects and only makes Tom Holland's Spider-Man stronger in those avenues. Their dynamics is incredible. Their chemistry is great. Andrew Garfield is amazing. Tobey Maguire is amazing. Tom Holland's great. I love the uses of Zendaya in here as MJ and how their relationship continues to merge and coming off Far From Home where everyone knows his identity to see how that comes to fruition and how that affects his life is awful but the entire usage of the film and the way that they bring in the multiverse while again messy i like it and i have so much fun with this and it just again it's one of those films that just gets better and better by each act and again becomes that love letter to live action spider-man movies we're at my top six and my number six is the brand new Deadpool and Wolverine movie, which has only climbed this list the more and more I think about the movie. And the reason that being, 
it's a fucking great movie. Yeah, I can say the F word now because Deadpool can say it. And I came into this movie very worried. I came into this movie worried about how are you going to merge Deadpool into the MCU? Deadpool 2 I thought was fine. It wasn't as great as the first one. And at the same time, also now you're touching on Logan and how are you going to be taking away that legacy of Logan from Hugh Jackman? That is a worry. Hugh Jackman was incredible in the role and he gave it his all in Logan and now you have to touch on that. And they gave me everything I wanted and even a little bit more. This is, just like I said, No Way Home is a love letter to Spider-Man live action films. This is a love letter to what Fox did with the X-Men films and even a tad bit more than that. If you've seen the film, you understand what I'm talking about. But it's a love letter to what Fox actually did in creating the comic book movie boom back in the 2000s. And without that original X-Men movie, who knows? The MCU might not even be a thing. But Deadpool and Wolverine solidifies that, delivers an emotional avenue on that love letter, and gives a reason for Hugh Jackman to actually come back as Logan. Because you can't have that love letter without him. If you were to make this movie with any other person playing Wolverine or bring in any other X-Men into this to be tagged along with Deadpool or even have Deadpool go on this solo adventure by himself, it would not work. The counterbalance of these two characters needing one another in this film I think is one of the strongest aspects and as well as Wade needing to find purpose which is something that almost every person goes through and what happens when he's tagged along with a Wolverine that also needs to find purpose once again in his life. That is what you see here. Two people who can't die who need that purpose. And the action is incredible for the most part. There's a couple scenes where I wish they would have gotten a little bit more stylized with it. But I think Sean Levy overall does a good job bringing that emotion in. I should have shouted him out a little bit more in my review about that. Couple too many needle drops. Again, the action, I would have liked a little bit more stylized at one point in time. But it's a damn good time with some incredible surprises and cameos that I have a blast with. Then we get into my number five, which is Avengers Endgame, which is such an incredible amount of energy, specifically coming off of all the Phase 3 and how excited you were with that, and then you jump on board with it and you're like, fuck yeah, Avengers Endgame, man! And it just nails the bit so well. It gives all that culmination of everything you watched over the decade, and it comes together in a beautiful and poetic and poignant way. Is some things a little bit like, okay, like, did the rat have to hit the button? Sure, there's moments like that that make you roll your eyes a bit, but the emotional avenue and the emotional territory you go on in this film after Infinity War is truly some of the best in the MCU, and I love, love, love this movie so much. Plus, it has some of the best crowd-worthy moments ever in a film. Cap picking up Mjolnir, top tier. Then we get into my number four, which is Loki. And Loki... The first season I love, and the second season I was a little bit complicated on when it first premiered, but it got stronger by the end, and specifically Loki's entire character arc. is one of the reasons that the show works so well for me is because by the time you see where Loki ends his story at, it became one of the most emotional things for me. I love the TVA, I love everything they do in here, I love how weird and again insane this show goes, and specifically this is like the most menacing Kang that we've had yet, but the usage of Tom Hiddleston and when you see Loki's story from the first Thor film to now, it would make Thor proud. And it makes me feel proud of Loki for what he's been able to establish here. Which now brings me to my number three, and it is Guardians of the Galaxy, which I think is one of the best original team-up movies of all time. And it's one of the best comic book movies of all time, and specifically what James Gunn was able to do with introducing this entire team to the MCU was a great thing. I think the fact that you instantly come to love these characters is one of my more favorite aspects of this entire series, and specifically when you look at the MCU, you they're your favorite assholes of space and guardians for me has been an important limelight where i feel relatable to a couple different characters in here but i also love seeing their dynamic and how much they grow with one another now getting to see where guardians 3 goes it's one of those films that's only elevated from there and it's been a long time where guardians 1 was my number one favorite mcu film but it's been dismissed now to number three. Brings me to my number two, and that's Avengers Infinity War. I think this just culminates all of the fun action you want to see. You want to see all these characters and all these actors pairing with one another and, again, establishing three different teams. Well, for the most part, two different teams by the end point where you have, like, Tony in space with the Guardians and with Spider-Man and with Doctor Strange, and then you have Cap on the ground with Black Panther and Scarlet Witch and all these sorts of things. 
and seeing how this war works. It really is a war in defending the Infinity Stones. And it feels like a race the second it kicks off. And the Russo brothers do a great job developing this because of how much time has passed in the Civil War and where a lot of our main characters are. But the fact that Infinity War is able to establish so much great action, so much entertaining, and so much big stakes leaves this to be one of my favorite MCU films because the first time you watched it, while you know most of your characters probably going to come back to life, those moments and memories of hearing people fucking jaws drop when they lost it's one of the few comic book movies where they lost and i love that but my number one favorite mcu film of all time right now is guardians of the galaxy volume 3 i said it back when i did my guardians of the galaxy mcu ranking i'm still saying it now it is one of the best comic book movies of all time it's one of the best endings to a comic book movie of all time and it's the reason that i established the guardians of the galaxy comic book trilogy is my favorite comic book trilogy of all time why is that? Because Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 delivered such an impactful ending that makes every film that came prior to it stronger. And I already loved 1, I already liked 2, but now I love 1 even more, and I love 2 finally. And 3 establishes all these character arcs in the one thing. You have phenomenal action, that one take hall scene was just top tier superhero-ness. You get into the whole aspect of Rocket Raccoon's life and his backstory, and how depressing it was, but also how emotional it was, and it makes Rocket Raccoon my favorite MCU character, Star-Lord and his development, and where he's at in his life, and how he's dealing with the Gamora thing, and even, like, if you told me going into this that you would be just, like, I was not going to be happy if Gamora didn't stick with Star-Lord, but the fact that you actually made me happy with where she ended up, made me happy with where everyone ended up, even if that's not what I wanted, then you did some top-tier writing there. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is just a perfect movie, a perfect embodiment, and a perfect ending to a trilogy, and a perfect ending to a set of characters, while at the same time, a new beginning for some others. I love this film, and I know a lot of you guys do as well. It is the best MCU film thus far, so far, and I'm so happy to be saying that. That's my ranking of the entire MCU from worst to best. Again, I did not include Daredevil. I did not include Jessica Jones. I did not include any of those other shows because I just I just don't count them. But feel free to count them in yours. I know some of those are canon. Thank you so much again for watching this, and of course, until next time, stay classy.